Okay, thank you for asking me to come and speak at this um, excellent conference. Just introducing myself, I'm currently the clinical and strategic lead for our Zero Suicide Programme in Merseycare. It's a large trust in the northwest of England. I'm also a practicing consultant clinical psychologist working in adult mental health. Not least, I guess I'm really passionate about the subject of suicide prevention. Um, and have been since I was a nursing assistant working on a psychiatric ward many years ago. So it's a, a topic close to my, um, my heart for many years. Okay, so measuring outcomes in suicide prevention. It comes with challenges uh, alongside opportunities as well. So what are some of those challenges? Well, firstly, <clears throat> although devastating, every loss of life by suicide is devastating, the numbers are relatively small. So therefore, it's kind of lacking in statistical power to demonstrate definitive reductions in suicides or self-harm in a statistically significant way. So what else can we do and what else can we think about? Well, I guess slightly counterintuitively, suicide prevention in clinical services is not just about suicide prevention outcomes. And what I mean by that is that the measures that we put in place as part of a strategic plan actually improve the quality of care for everyone, not just those who are deemed at high risk. Also thinking about how we demonstrate impact over time in large systems of care. So we often have to take a long-term view, track where we introduce interventions so that we can see over time. So that can sometimes be difficult when you're, you're trying to demonstrate impact within a programme. However, there is a lot that we can do. And just to say a little bit about that, outcomes that can be measured in many different ways. For example, if we take the first one, when you implement anything strategically, there is a lot of learning to be gained from that implementation and they are learning outcomes. Also thinking about how we ask the people who use our services, the people who are on the receiving end of the interventions that we deliver, what is it that they suggest we do to improve the outcomes of care? So as we go through the presentation, I'll give some examples of these areas that we can utilize in order to produce some outcomes. So what did we do in Merseycare NHS Foundation Trust? Well, us along with some other trusts at the time committed to this really bold, audacious, audacious goal of working towards zero suicide. So we produced a strategy and a policy, and it was around these four key pillars. We wanted our care to be effective and safe. We wanted to really engage our partners and service users. We wanted to produce competent workforce and look at the research and evaluation that was possible in the field. So we focused the, the 10 key interventions around those pillars. Now, around about the same time, the National Confidential Inquiry produced their 10 ways to improve safety. So this gave us an opportunity really to benchmark how we were doing with our program against a kind of a nationally um, recognized program such as the NCI and what they were suggesting that services should do. So like any strategic approach, we, we did have some successes. In fact, we had a reduction in suicides by 22%. And we co-produced some staff training and our collaborative safety planning intervention. This is an evidence-based intervention, and it's one that we worked with a group of service users and staff to produce. However, we learned a lot, and that's perhaps the most significant outcome. What did we learn from trying to address this issue of um, suicides within healthcare and what it was like to implement a strategy? We realised that what we needed really was a much more systematic approach if we were going to implement more broadly. So what we found was we had pockets of good practice but this, this was pockets and we wanted to standardise what we were doing across the system and reduce the inconsistencies and variation. We learnt a lot about transitions, certainly the evidence in um, the growing evidence in the, the research nationally and internationally was telling us 
that transitions are very, very risky. We saw it in the sad deaths that occurred within our care as well, that whilst people were waiting for a service or when they've been discharged, this could put someone at risk of suicide. So I just want to focus a moment on one of our key successes, which was our evidence-based collaborative intervention of the safety plan. This just shows you the, the resources that are produced with it. We've got a practitioner's guide with techniques um, to help staff and guide them through the process of completing the intervention. We've also got a helpful uh, resource that details all sorts of self-help resources so that the practitioner can guide the service user towards these when they get to the problem solving element of the safety plan. Then what we wanted to do is we wanted to evaluate and see is this intervention feasible to introduce into business as usual across a very large trust. So we had a mixed method design and we trialled it out over four sites. One was a community setting and one was an inpatient setting. And we had some really interesting findings and outcomes. And you'll see in blue there, when I spoke earlier on about, you know, what are the areas where we can produce outcomes? So we saw some changes across the system. Those people who had safety plans were presenting less at the emergency department than those people who didn't. We saw that there was a 0% readmission to inpatient ward during a time frame of three months of implementation. And perhaps an unintended consequence was we saw that there was a reduction in complaints as well from service users. So that was telling us that the experience of service users and our patients was actually improved by the implementation of the safety plan. We did some qualitative interviews with our staff and service users, and they were telling us things like, for example, our staff would say, this is actually what I went into nursing to do. It feels like I'm really getting to know the person and able to do something structured and productive. And our service users were saying, you know, this has really instilled hope in me that I can do something that for myself and there are things I can do as well as having people that I can call. From an implementation and, and kind of system point of view, we learned that strong leadership was really important to implement anything effectively. There are multiple teams, all with different cultures. So leadership was key to, to the effectiveness of this. Clinically, there was some impact in, in the measures that we used. So we looked at what did the safety plan and intervention do to influence the alliance between practitioner and the service user? How much of a sense of control did our service users feel? And also, what did it do to their ability to cope with their emotions? Um, did it improve things? And what we found was that there was actually a positive influence on um, as measured by the, the chosen quality improvement measures that we used. So of course, suicide prevention research was advancing. We were learning all the time. And what we wanted to do is design a new strategy based on this learning and emerging evidence. And this saw the, the um, creation really of our new strategy called CLEAR3. Now, what it is, it's, it's an acronym, and each of the letters are representative according to the literature and our learning of necessary suicide prevention care. So to give you an example, the C, there's three things attached to that. One is we must be compassionate in everything that we do. We need to think about how we connect and transition people, um, you know, look at the continuity of care, that we are um, giving the person as they move through our system and what, what opportunities are we providing for them to have a sense of purpose in their community. So that's just an example where each letter, B for example, we need to be effective in what we do, we, we need to use evidence base and we need to engage all of our stakeholders. And we did this um, strategy really on the basis of if we don't do something radical, then what we get is pockets of good practice, but also we're, we're kind of tweaking around the edges and the evidence was telling us we needed to make some radical changes. So that is what we did. And the strength of it really is the um, application of the model 
uh, in its entirety to any system. Uh, and we can apply this to service users, stakeholders, our staff. We need to look out for suicide prevention in the workforce. And also you could apply it to a business if you wanted your business to be suicide prevention um, savvy, really. You know, apply these principles in, in how you employ people and how you behave towards them and what you do. So this was our model of a whole system advancement towards zero suicide. It has an action plan, and this is our current focus where we're looking at transitions, thinking about the suicide-specific interventions that we deliver, standardising our practice, understanding our population, trying to prevent people coming into our services, working with our service users, and really giving our staff the skills that they need in order to assess, intervene, and, and actually work clinically with people who may well be suicidal. So these are our essential areas in our work plan that we feel we need to do now to make our organisation safer. We have also got some more innovative approaches that I'll talk about just a bit later that are using intelligence, designing pathways and creating partnerships with our um, local population. So just a taster as to where we're up to. So this was our training. It's called E-RISK, stands for Effective Risk Intervention Skills. It's modular. And what was different about the training in our new strategy was we, need, we knew that we needed to give assurance and we needed to look out for the quality. And whilst people can attend training, and this is you know really, really important, how do we know it's having an impact? And what does it do to people's competencies? So we made it a mandatory training and it's competency based. We built in a module about safety planning, which enabled us to spread uh, safety planning practice much more quickly across the system. What the this slide shows us is the, the growth of um, e-risk. So we're up to 96% of our eligible staff are now trained in this modular based training. And you can see the spread, the increase in the spread of safety plan in practice across our organisation as a result, really, of incorporating it into this package. Again, we are looking for not only spread, but quality. So we're following that up with um, audit and, you know, making, making sure we review and monitor the quality of the plans that are produced. Whenever we have to review any incidents, one of the key questions we ask now is, well, did, were they offered a safety plan? And actually, that, that's a progress outcome, you know, because six years in, we're in a position where this is a expected standard of practice for anyone who comes under our care. I want to just play a video now. This is Iris, and Iris helped us develop the, um, the safety plan and intervention. And she also uh, works within our trust, uh, utilizing and drawing upon her lived experience and tells us really what's important. So this is referring to asking people with lived experience what's important in order to improve outcome. I've been there too many times really to want to think about but today is about helping others and that's why I'm here so if we're thinking about crisis plans I'm in that dreadful dark horrible silent all-consuming place at that point in my life I don't want to be here I'm hearing things from the past, the trauma that I struggled with from a little girl, that I'm bad, wicked, never be any good. And I truly, truly believe every single word my mixed up mind is telling me. So that's the initial part of the start of any crisis plan, the very beginning. You won't be able to reach me. At that point, you can't possibly get to me or reach me. You just need to sit with me quietly and hold that pain for me until I'm able to get to 
places where I can be safe, feel cared for, in some way loved and safe. Someone did that for me several times and my children have now got their mum back. I work with some of the most amazing, amazing staff who dreamed for me before I could even begin to dream for myself. And for that, I am so grateful. And then thinking, moving forward, hold that pain for me till either you can get someone to come and help you because you will need help. Get me to a place of safety and then the journey begins and it's a hard, long journey. But we can do this together. We have to do it together. But the crisis plan, the start of any crisis plan is the person. I am a person. I'm in total distress. And I need you to break that silence for me so that I can tell you how, how you can help me. And then you begin a new part of the crisis plan. A plan that will help bring me back to being me. Um, being able to speak with you and being heard. Because sometimes that's all everyone needs. So really, there's your start. But before I go, I want to say thank you. Thank you for helping me be me, for seeing me as Iris. Someone who's got brains, a sense of humour. Wicked, someone says. But I am me, and I'm still here. So a really moving video from Iris and, and really what we did in terms of how we, we used what Iris told us along with other service users to do in creating our safety plans was we, we, we taught our staff how to engage with service users, that it was important to go at the, their pace, take time to understand and listen to them and not to jump to solutions too quickly that really it is about getting alongside somebody and being with them in that moment and working slowly and at their pace. I so I want to I want to thank Iris for, for doing that for us. So just moving on towards the last part of the presentation, this is an area that sits in our kind of what we would call our leading and in innovative areas, thinking about how can we use intelligence learning from our instance and looking at our population data to develop partnerships to prevent people coming into our services. So we had a really exciting project actually with Holmusk. Holmusk is a digital health solutions company and what we asked them to do was in 2020 we did unfortunately have a peak in the number of deaths by suicide. This was during Covid time and we asked them as part of this partnership with them to look at 143 sad deaths really by suicide that had happened in our care over the course of um, four years and the reason we asked them to do this is because we'd done the uh, strategic evidence review for the new strategy we were we had a hunch and kind of knew that there was a number of key areas key risk factors that we were seeing time and time again in our incidents and it was also reflected in the research literature that there was a number of people um, who went on to take their own life who had a number of specific risk factors so what they found was what we expected in a way was the people who went on to take their own life in our care they had had multiple contacts with our urgent care services within their risk assessment documentation. It was showing suicidal ideation and, you know, and or self-harm. And also they were people who we were struggling to engage with for whatever reason. It was perhaps people who'd lost faith. In, in mental health services and um, they were touching lots of different services but weren't actually engaged in any consistent package of care. We then asked them uh, to repeat this analysis and the reason we asked them to repeat it was because we designed a pathway as part of the strategy but we wanted to see if 
the things that um, they found initially were still being found when they ran their analysis. So in 2022, they repeated the process and so interesting, they found very similar things. So then we thought as an organisation, we need to do something because we have this information um, on those bigger numbers of you know, sad deaths that occurred. So what we did is we developed um, and started to think about how we might pilot a pathway. This is our self-harm and suicide prevention pathway, and it's informed by those insights and our um, learning, obviously, from our incidents and also what research was telling us. What was timely, too, is um, England produced a national guidelines. It's called NICE. National Institute for Clinical Excellence produced guidelines for staff in how to respond to people for self-harm, what the evidence is telling us and what the key interventions might be. So this pathway outlined here, it features some of our key interventions that are in our strategy, what's recommended by the NICE guidelines. But what it does is it has a time frame across the top. So we want to respond very quickly when someone's in a crisis with exactly what is needed to avert the crisis. And along the bottom there, you can see the number of services who might be involved with the person in this pathway. So the pathway follows the person rather than it getting caught up in just a crisis team service, say, because when we put things in that way into one team, then capacity uh, outweighs the um, the capacity of the team, basically. So we it blocks, it gets blocked, and then we have then we create waiting lists. So we needed a number of services to be involved in this pathway, including our voluntary sector services. So we started this July thirty first this year, and we've got a twelve month evaluation planned. Other ways that we've used um, population data is to think about um, how we might you know, develop a plan to work in partnership with local communities. So another example is Liverpool um, in the inner city area saw higher numbers of suicide during uh, the COVID period. As a consequence, there was some funding that came called post-COVID recovery money into our uh, trust to work in partnership with Liverpool City Council. So this is how we went about developing uh, different kinds of interventions that we could do. For example, we were scoping out what's currently offered in communities, what campaigns are there, what trainings available in the voluntary sector, and how can we as a provider organisation support those um, interventions and developments. Interestingly, recently, the National Guide policy and strategy for suicide prevention has been released in England. So we often align you know, our kind of strategy and our partnership work with the national strategy. So that's something we've been doing, doing recently. But having a way of structuring the partnerships that you develop with local communities is important. And then another way to, to track, you know, how, how, we, how are we doing against the national picture? So this slide has come from ENKISH, the National Confidential Inquiry into Suicide and Self-Harm. And this shows Mersey Care rates, patient suicide are consistently lower than the national average. This is according to their report that goes up to 2020. The reason there's a lag is due to the coroner's um, the delay really in coroner's conclusion. So we have the report to 2020. And despite us as an organisation being an a, a organisation where there is really uh, quite high levels of deprivation, lots of poverty, significant drug use in uh, certain areas and high rates of self-harm in certain areas, we are still tracking below the national average. So over time, we'll be able to look of what happens to that as we introduced our five new five-year strategy in 2020. So finally, I started off with this slide, you know, what can we do to demonstrate outcomes? Hopefully you've seen that you can uh, use strategic implementation to give you a learning outcome so we know what to do next, what's worked, what hasn't. We can ask the people who use our services to tell us how to achieve better outcomes, tell us how to relate in a more compassionate way. We can test out our new 
evidence-based interventions through quality improvement cycles. That'll give us experience, what people thought of the intervention and any kind of clinical outcome as we saw in using of those measures. That alongside evaluation, testing things out, seeing if it's feasible, using measures within the system. So you saw that we, we tracked if people present to A&E, now they had a safety plan. What's the longitudinal timeline? So we're six years in of safety plan in practice, for example. So we can show, we saw in that chart, how that's changed over time. And we can plot the different things that we did, for example, making training mandatory. We have got a number of research areas going on, particularly introducing safety plans into um, schools and uh, looking at you know, what, what we can do there. We've got the pilot in the uh, ED department, the suicide prevention pathway. Depending on outcome, we will spread that more broadly and then look at is this something nationally that um, other organisations can benefit from. And we continually adapt our strategy based on the learning from the, any sad incidents. And this helps us with our quality improvement programmes and the pathways of care that we design. So to conclude, a pair of trainers there, just to say, you know, it requires perseverance, any kind of strategic implementation for suicide prevention really is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's a process of continuous improvement led by multifaceted outcomes, learning and adaptation. So thank you. And please, if anybody wants to get in touch, our email address is there and we, we will, of course, get back to you. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Inaya Svetic. It's my great pleasure to be joining you for this event from the beautiful Queensland in Australia. I'm with the Gold Coast Primary Health Network. However, in my talk, I'm going to be describing the evaluation um, of the Zero Suicide Framework. We undertook at Gold Coast Mental Health and Specialist Services a little while ago with my colleagues, Dr. Catherine Turner and Professor Chris Tableberg. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respect um, to the traditional owners of the land on which, um, from which I'm joining you today, um, the Yugambe speaking people of the Southeast Queensland and the elders past, present and emerging. I'm gonna start my talk with just setting the scene, describing the context in which uh, this work took place. Gold Coast Mental Health and Specialist Services, part of Gold Coast Health, which provides public sector health care in hospital and community settings for a population of around 600,000 people. We have one of the busiest emergency departments in the country that sees around 10,000 mental health related presentations per year. In late 2015, Gold Coast Mental Health was the first um, health uh, service that um, introduced the, um, that started implementing a systems approach to suicide prevention using zero suicide framework, following extensive consultations with relevant stakeholders, um, which included the hospital executive leadership, the board, clinicians, and also importantly, consumers and carers. Other features of our implementation strategy included training that was provided to all mental health staff, emphasis on the principles of restorative just culture, which were embedded into all elements of suicide prevention, including um, support provided to our clinicians and improved responding to clinical incidents. Mm -hmm. And finally, commitment to continuous quality improvement. The table on the right shows the seven elements of Zero Suicide Framework, and there were a range of activities that were developed at our service um, under each of these elements. However, I'd just like to um, position the development of our clinical pathway of care, the suicide prevention pathway, on this map, um, spanning four of those elements, identifying age and treat, and acknowledging that um, the transition element was partly addressed in collaboration with uh, um, other health partners in the region. 
SPP consists of uh, implemented at low cost mental health consists of um, several elements. Notably, we completely replaced the risk assessment, which was previously previously used to stratify and predict risk of suicide with a prevention oriented risk formulation. We incorporated elements of an interviewing technique developed by Shea called chronological assessment of suicide events. Um, there's great emphasis on completion of safety planning intervention, including counseling on access to legal means. Um, involvement of consumer, consumer and carers in development um, of um, the care plan, face-to-face um, -face follow up following um, discharge within 48 hours of discharge, and then finally ensuring safe transitions of care where possible with um, warm handover to a community-based support agency. SVP was implemented in our service um, across all age groups across the entire service without any increase in clinical workforce. Therefore, we um, needed to take a rather pragmatic approach to identifying consumers to be placed on SPP. We developed four criteria um, for determining eligibility for placement on the pathway. Those were all consumers presenting or have those who have had a recent suicide attempt, those who presented with ideation and had a history of a suicide attempt, um, all patients that were admitted to inpatient care due to the suicide risk, and then finally at um, any other consumers um, at the clinician's discretion. Implementation of SPP had a strong focus on data-driven um, evaluation, particularly um, to enable timely feedback to be provided to clinical teams and progress the continuous quality improvement um, approach. And it was particularly important that evaluation implementation occurred in parallel with the clinical implementation. Now, at the time of um, developing our evaluation framework, there was rather scarce document documentation available um, on the implementation of suicide, uh, zero suicide in other settings. And particularly notable um, was the lack of any robust evidence of its effectiveness. There were some early um, uh, reports of its effectiveness in reducing deaths by suicide, um, notably uh, a 2016 paper by Kofi and Kofi um, describing the implementation of perfect depression care at Henry Ford Health System in Michigan, US. Um, however, with rather limited insight into the methodology behind it um, or other information that would be um, supported other health services looking to adopt a similar process. So this is how um, this, uh, our evaluation framework um, looked a little bit like this. It had two arms. One was process evaluation, which monitored the percentage of the targeted population that engaged with SVP, and then the fidelity with which um, elements of the pathway were implemented. On the, other, on the other hand, the outcome evaluation monitored short and long-term outcomes for clinical outcomes for consumers engaging with SVP notably any changes in representat representations with suicide attempts and deaths by suicide. This is the program logic we developed to support and guide our evaluation um, approaches. It's a rather busy visual, but I think it is, um, it's a good representation of the complex health system and a number of dynamic components, uh, which all contributed towards the findings observed in our studies. Now, sourcing data to inform the evaluation of SPP was rather challenging. Um, however, at the same time, presented an opportunity for some innovative solutions, which um, will improve evaluation um, efforts in the future. Um, there were two data sources we used in our work. One was the emergency department data collection uh, called FirstNet. It um, helped inform the process and outcome evaluation. Now, the greatest challenge related to ED data was the um, under-recording of suicidality due to the heterogeneity of diagnostic codes um, used in, um, in, in ED um, administrative data collections, um, therefore requiring um, quite substantial manual uh, or human input and additional resources. 
Uh, our other um, data source was uh, CIMA. This is a, a system we use um, at our service for storing all clinical documentation on mental health consumers. Uh, data from this data source inform predominantly process evaluation, monitoring the fidelity of implementation of, um, of the pathway. Now, the main challenge related to using SEMA data was that the great majority of relevant information was contained within unstructured clinical notes and required substantial investment of resources to sift through those records to extract relevant information. Um, this is just a, a demonstration of the under-recording of suicidal representation we observed um, in our service. Had we been using only ICD diagnostic codes pertaining to suicidality, um, we would only accurately detect around 35% of um, the true volume of suicidal representations. And when supplementing ICD diagnostic codes with presenting problem with cases flagged as uh, having a presenting problem of suicidal ideation, the accuracy rose to only just a bit over fifty percent. So a solution we developed um, at our service to address this problem was a machine learning tool uh, based on an evolutionary algorithm. We called it Seros. Seros, the algorithm was calibrated um, against a psychiatrist-rated training data set and was able to predict whether a consumer record in administrative, administrative ED data collection represented a suicidal presentation or not with a high level of accuracy, it had sensitivity of 0.95 and specificity of 0.92. There's a more detailed um, description of the development of this tool is available in the paper that um, I think published in 2021. Um, we undertook an estimation of the time savings um, afforded to us with the application of the CEROSP tool. We found that um, uh, sifting through six months worth of ED data um, saved us around 90% of time and human resources in comparison to a more old fashioned human labor only approach. Similarly, the substantial and ultimately unsustainable costs involved with having um, a dedicated position that was reviewing clinical notes of consumers placed on SBP to extract information to inform process evaluation has now been replaced with the development of what we call a mental health journey board which is a, a tracking system that allows for easy flagging of consumers placed on SBP and recording of completion of individual components. And importantly, um, alerting clinicians to any components that have not yet been completed. So combined, these two approaches have dramatically improved the ease of data collection and also accuracy to inform future evaluations of SBP. Next, I'm just gonna briefly um, show some basic statistics that um, were observed through an ongoing process evaluation of SPP in its first few years. Um, and that will provide some more context for integrating findings of outcome evaluation. Um, in the first, just looking at the numbers of consumers placed on SPP, we saw that in the first year, we were on average placing around 100 consumers um, uh, per month. In subsequent years, this number has grew to closer to 200 consumers a month. There's a variety of reasons for it. Um, some of it would just have to be due to an ever-growing population of Gold Coast and uh, growing numbers of presentations to emergency departments, but also due to the greater familiarization uh, with the SPP, its processes, and recognition of benefits amongst our clinicians. We also observe strong fidelity to individual components of the pathway. We see around 85% of consumers having completed risk formulation and safety plan, around 60% of consumers having um, recorded um, counseling on lethal means. Um, and the availability of this feedback and regular communication with our clinical teams helped us identify whether there was need for any additional training, resources, or other types of support to maintain um, that strong fidelity to the pathway. 
And for the last part of my talk, I'm going to present results of the outcome evaluation that we undertook at our service. We try to address uh, two questions. Um, we looked at the impact of SPP on repeated presentations with suicide attempts and a reduction in deaths by suicide among mental health consumers. Both of these studies have been published in the paper shown on the slide, so you're welcome to read those um, for more information. Um, the first question around the impact of SPP on representation with suicide attempts, uh, we took, uh, to answer that question, we took a sample of 604 consumers that presented to our service with a suicide attempt in the second part of 2017. We compared the the percentage of uh, the percentage of representations with a suicide attempt between consumers placed on a pathway and those not placed on the pathway and followed them for seven, 14, 30, and 90 days. Our results confirmed that indeed placement on SPP reduced the risk of um, representation across all of these intervals. Notably, the, um, the reduction in the risk was greatest at 7 and 14 days post-discharge, which we assume might be related to the fact that the average length of SVP placement was around 16 days, during which time the consumers were in um, an active contact with the health service through um, follow-up appointments. However, still at three months post-discharge, the risk of representation for people not placed on the pathway was about 1.6 times higher compared to those placed on the pathway. And next, we applied a somewhat more sophisticated um, study design to the same cohort of patients, time to recurrent event analysis. Um, now, because the area of statistical analysis taking into account multiple events is relatively new and there's no consensus on what model, what statistical model is best placed to answer um, such research questions, in our study we applied six different models. Uh, for more statistically minded listeners, these six models are described um, in, in the paper. We also included a um, range of covariates, spanning demographic and clinical characteristics to test for their contribution to the risk of representation with a suicide attempt. Um, in, very encouragingly, results show that irrespective of the model used, placement on the pathway led to a longer time to representation compared with those not placed on the pathway and that placement on the pathway reduced the risk of a repeated suicide attempt by about 35%. There was um, another important finding that came out of this analysis. Um, we observed that there were particular cohorts of consumers that had a natural higher risk of representation with a suicide attempt. Those were people um, with, a pers uh, with a diagnosis of a personality disorder, indigenous, um, Aboriginal um, or Torres Strait Islander consumers, those presenting with the second or subsequent suicide attempt as opposed to their first, and younger people. Now, these, are, um, these uh, observations have been documented uh, quite widely, widely in um, in literature. However, an important finding of our study was that the effects of SPP were proportionate in reducing hazard for representations with suicide attempts for all patient groups. So regardless of their age, indigenous status, personality disorder, or having past suicide attempts. For example, a person diagnosed with a personality disorder placed on the pathway begins with a higher natural risk of representation than a consumer without a personality disorder. Yet after placement on SVP, both observe a reduction in that hazard of representation of around 35%. Now this finding is really important because it's been observed that consumers with a diagnosed personality disorder were less likely to be placed on the pathway perhaps because clinicians um, assume that the pathway would be less effective for this cohort of um, consumers. 
Similarly, the findings about effectiveness of the pathway on first time presenters makes it really important for health services to provide assertive outreach and clinical interventions to these consumers presenting with their first suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, preventing the likelihood of them becoming multiple presenters who have a natural higher hazard for representation. Um, and now in answering a second evaluation, outcome evaluation question, whether SPP contributed to a reduction of deaths by suicide, we, um, we looked at the number of suicides that happened in our service since 2013. So we went back four years prior to the implementation of the pathway um, and um, looked at all the cases of suspected suicides of consumers who were either open to our service at the time of death or had been closed with our service within 30 days prior to death and then calculated a, a rate of um, suicide um, deaths by mental health consumers as a percentage of all service episodes, that is numbers of consumers that had at least one face-to-face -face engagement. Um, again, results of this analysis, um, or I should also point out that we took um, cumulative rates of suicides in the four years prior to the implementation and subsequent three years, um, to mitigate against this potential of uh, significant variability across a short period of time because these were um, there was a relatively small sample of deaths included in this analysis. Um, encouragingly, again, results show that in the post-SPP period, rate of suicides by mental health consumers decreased by around 23%. So just finally, some reflections on, on the work um, and the, the findings of our evaluation studies. Um, the experience of Gold Coast Mental Health demonstrated that zero suicide framework, when combined with some limited but well-placed resources, can assist in embedding evidence-based practices across a large health service. Um, since its implementation in 2016, um, suicide prevention pathway has benefited thousands of consumers of Gold Coast Mental Health and results demonstrated they improve, improved clinical outcomes. We do, however, acknowledge there were several limitations in our work, the main one being that the study designs um, we used prevent making any firm conclusions about the efficacy of the SBP and the observed relationships cannot be interpreted as causal. Therefore, there's a requirement for future studies to use more robust, robust designs in evaluating outcomes of zero suicide framework. Um, our experiences with rather laborious investments of time and resources into obtaining reliable data to inform evaluation have also highlighted the need for uh, more advanced technological solutions to assist with such endeavors in the future. And we're very pleased to observe there's been great strides done in, um, in recent times in this space. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please get in touch with myself or Catherine Turner um, if you'd like to continue this conversation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Celine Larkin. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School. And I'm really happy to be here um, to present on behalf of my co-authors on implementing the zero suicide model at UMass Memorial Health. I'm gonna talk about some of our processes and outcomes from this um, study. So just to disclose, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. And this um, study, this grant was funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health and uh, represents solely our views. So I think for everyone who's here, we recognize the severe public health impact of suicide. And um, this poignant quote, I think, really captures the after effects of suicide. It has a blast radius. And if you are within that blast radius, you are forever affected. We know that 30 to 50% of Americans know someone who has died by suicide. And the estimated number of people affected by every suicide is around 135. Um, so it really is something that has huge impacts on our communities. Um, the zero suicide model was developed as a way to 
impact the increasing rates of suicide in the US, and it really focuses on healthcare settings. It's a priority of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, and it's a goal within the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. And there are these kind of seven components to the model, um, several of which are kind of more clinical components, so identifying, engaging, treating, and transitioning patients. And then these three more implementation style components around leadership, training, and improving. So within our um, healthcare system, we wanted to improve various aspects of the clinical, um, clinical components of the zero suicide model. And we focused a lot on identification and um, engaging patients with suicide risk. Our healthcare system is a large uh, healthcare system in central Massachusetts. It comprises of five hospitals with um, six different emergency departments, including a pediatric emergency department and a psychiatric emergency department, um, 39 inpatient units and eight facility based primary care clinics. So that's the setting in which we were implementing the zero suicide model. And we focused initially um, around the identification, improved identification of suicide risk, because we know that many medical patients have latent suicide risk. So about 12% of people who present to the emergency department endorse passive suicidal ideation. Um, and about um, five to six percent will endorse active suicidal ideation in the recent past. And we know that asking about suicide does not cause a person to become suicidal. So within our system, we chose to implement universal screening for suicide risk using the patient safety screener. So uh, with the patient safety screener, we have a primary screening element and a secondary screening element. So the primary screening is intended to detect if any non-negligible risk in exists within the patient. And then the secondary screening component is to stratify risk so that we know whether a person needs, for example, immediate safety precautions or whether they're in the milder strata and perhaps would benefit from a behavioral health evaluation, but do not need um, urgent safety precautions. So that was kind of the screening model that we adopted within our zero, zero suicide implementation. Um, the patient safety screener was administered during triage or initial nursing assessment, and it's used with all patients who are 12 years and older, regardless of their presenting complaint. So that is a universal suicide screening approach. Um, the screening tool was able to determine the absence or presence of suicidality with the primary questions, and we um, specified that all three primary screening questions should be asked every time. So this is the screener that we um, implemented universally. So a positive screen on this patient safety screener was yes to have you had thoughts of killing yourself in the last two weeks or in the past six months, have you attempted to kill yourself? So that was flagged as a suicide positive. And in a little bit, I'll discuss how we integrated this into our electronic health record to make sure that patients who were um, answering or, or screening positive for suicide risk were um, clearly visible in the electronic health record. And then once a person endorsed um, one of these two um, criteria, then they progressed to secondary screening. So this was a, a really interesting piece of the study where initially our secondary screener had, you know, it has six items. So we generally kind of advised providers that, you know, the more items that the person endorsed, generally the higher the risk. But really, um, in response to joint commission requirements that changed during the study time, study period, we um, did analyses to generate strata associated with the secondary screening tool so that providers had very clear guidance on what needed to happen with the various um, levels of risk. So there are six um, questions on the secondary screener. They're really indicators rather than items. So we um, rely on a variety of sources for these indicators. And the indicators are if a person is positive on both ideation and behavior from the primary screener, if they have a suicide plan, suicidal intent, a history of psychiatric hospitalization, um, substance misuse, or are irritable, agitated, or aggressive. So it's one um, point for each indicator, and then we were able to stratify the, the um, indicators into three strata. And we use all the data available. So the person who's completing the secondary screening can use self-report from the patient, collateral, uh, chart review, or and um, observation. 
So that results in a stratification of patients into mild, moderate, or high. And then the recommended care varied depending on which um, stratum the patient was in. So patients in the high risk strata, so they endorsed um, four of the indicators. They had uh, intent and plan, for example. Um, they were designated as high risk. So then there were safety precautions associated with those patients, such as a belonging search and one-to-one um, -one observer. Patients who were in the moderate category had um, some observation, but not as uh, resource intensive observation. And patients in the mild category um, were offered a behavioral health evaluation, but were not um, required to receive a behavioral health, uh, sorry, behavioral health evaluation in contrast to the other two strata. So it was a way to initially stratify patients to prioritize certain patients for behavioral health evaluations in an emergency department setting where resources are um, are constrained. The second clinical element from the zero suicide model that we focused a lot of our efforts on was the safety planning intervention. So this is a Stanley Brown six step safety plan. Um, we had to do a, a, some training and education around the fact that this is not contracting for safety. We still found that language was um, ubiquitous, especially in the primary care setting, um, providers talking about safety contracts. So the safety planning intervention is rather a prioritized written list of coping strategies and resources for use during a suicidal crisis. And it uses a collaborative approach with the patient. Um, it helps to provide a sense of control during crises, and it uses a brief, easy to read format that uses the patient's own words. And it can involve linking with family as well to share the safety plan and discuss its feasibility. And usually the safety planning intervention takes about 20 minutes to administer. So really, we talk about this as a brief intervention. We have found that within the emergency department setting, 20 minutes isn't generally considered to be a brief period of time. So we definitely face some challenges um, in being able to implement the safety planning intervention for that reason. So this is an example of just a mocked up safety plan. So you can see that the um, safety plan contains uh, information about the patient's warning signs. So again, generated in collaboration with the patient, they're encouraged to identify when they sense that a suicidal crisis might be oncoming. What are some of the internal coping strategies that they can use when they uh, notice their warning signs? What are some ways that they can distract themselves with social situations or people or places? Um, people that they can ask for help um, specifically. So um, uh, family members or other supporters and their phone numbers, uh, professionals that they can ask for help and um, reducing access to means. So making the environment safe by uh, reducing access to lethal means. So this was the six step safety plan that we uh, implemented um, and as I mentioned, we face some particular challenges in, in implementing this, and I'll, I'll review those outcomes in a, in a while. Um, so these were sort of the clinical components that we were seeking to implement. We also had initiatives around treatment and transition, but I don't have time to talk about those today, but happy to answer any questions by email after. Um, so it's helpful to think about when we're sort of thinking about implementing zero suicide components to think about the implementation strategies that we use. So just to kind of uh, infuse a little bit of implementation science here, I want to talk about um, what strategies are. So they're systematic intervention processes um, to adopt and integrate evidence-based healthcare innovations into, into usual care. So I like to think of it as, uh, for example, a crane. Um, so we are uh, doing things to support and embed a new practice. And so it can include things like training, facilitation or coaching, audit and feedback, making changes to the electronic health record template, producing patient facing materials, for example. So if we think about strategies as um, a crane, that is the how we are implementing um, the uh, package of the intervention. So the what. So we used actually a variety of implementation strategies to implement screening, to implement the safety planning intervention and so on. So um, if we think about healthcare systems, we might use several strategies to implement one new practice. And if we think about healthcare systems more generally, they have a lot of um, practices and strategies already in place. So sometimes when we're thinking about 
implementing a new program as comprehensive as a zero suicide model, we need to think about what are the suicide related and mental health related practices that are already in place and already expected within that setting. And what are some of the implementation strategies that are already being used? So within our healthcare system, we benefited a lot from infrastructure that was in place for continuous quality improvement. So everyone who joined UMass Memorial Healthcare System um, was obliged to take a white belt training uh, in lean continuous quality improvement, for example. So there was a lot of shared language around things like um, piloting, PDSAing, um, you know, uh, A3s. So there was a lot of shared language around continuous quality improvement that really helped us to um, implement these new clinical practices. So one of the implementation strategies that we used very much in the system of safety study was electronic health record changes. So the beauty of making changes to electronic health records is that it can do a variety of things. So it can serve as a reminder to say, OK, you know, this patient has screen positive, they require a behavioral health evaluation. It can provide structure for the clinician around some of their decision making. It can help with documentation. It can help with completion monitoring that allows implementers to do things like audit and feedback to pull data on what proportion of eligible patients are receiving screening, what proportion of eligible patients are receiving a safety plan, and feed that back to units to help um, change behavior and to do fidelity monitoring as well, like how complete are the safety plans, for example, how complete are the um, screenings. So the electronic health record um, was a huge advantage when we were trying to implement zero suicide within our system. And we um, actually switched EHR provider midstream in the study. So that was both a challenge and an opportunity because we were able to build additional suicide related tools into our new EHR. Um, but it, it definitely is a huge investment and, and it is quite time consuming, but it's very helpful. It does not mean just because people are documenting something in the EHR doesn't necessarily mean it's happening in practice. So that was something that I'll show you in a moment. We um, need to be mindful, I think, of the fact that some things can get documented in the EHR that are not necessarily happening and vice versa. Things that are happening in practice may not be documented in the EHR. I mentioned a while ago continuous quality improvement as a strategy um, for our implementation. So there was a lot of infrastructure around this within our system. CQI can help to change systems culture around suicide. So a huge part of the zero suicide model is around um, compassionate um, care for people who are at risk of suicide. And CQI can help to get at those more sort of humane attitudinal aspects, as well as increasing the efficiency of systems. So it really promotes frontline engagement. It's not a top down approach. It's bottom up problem solving, piloting and maintaining change. So it really empowers people across the whole healthcare system. And it's most feasible when there's already an existing CQI structure. So it's very difficult to maybe train people on CQI as you know, from scratch, but if there's already a, a infrastructure there, it's very helpful to be able to piggyback on that. So we showed, I guess, um, the success of that approach in our recent EE Safe 2 study as well. Um, another implementation strategy that we um, applied or um, I guess coordinated with was mandates. So um, the Joint Commission requirements around suicide related care changed significantly during our study period and it required. Um, for example, safety precautions for patients who are identified at higher risk of suicide, um, and it required um, suicide screening for behavioral health patients. And we really found that mandates like those were a double edged sword. So in some ways, they um, increased leadership buy in. There was now kind of attention and resources and investment being um, directed towards the um, suicide related care. Um, and there was more monitoring and remediation that was happening. But the other side, I suppose, of mandates is that there can be a box ticking element. So certainly there may be, again, sort of documentation for documentation's sake and not because a, a practice was actually done with good fidelity. Um, and it might even sort of undermine the spirit of some of the interventions that we're trying to put in place um, because it can, again, sort of feel like a requirement rather than something that people are more intrinsically motivated to do. Um, so just as a kind of a worked example of how we implemented screening in our system, we used a variety of strategies of reporting, online training, in-person at the elbow coaching um, with research staff and um, going and speaking with 
providers on the emergency department floor and nurses, uh, clinical reminders in the EHR, um, and again, sort of uh, leveraging those mandates from the Joint Commission as well. Um, and just to kind of point to some of the challenges that we experienced, again, the fidelity to the screening. So we found that documentation of screening was very high, um, but that when we asked patients whether they recalled being asked these three screening questions, actually um, two thirds of them reported being asked about depression and, and suicidal ideation and less than half reported being asked about a suicide attempt, even though they were documented as negative in the chart. So this is a really challenging area that needs um, extra attention, I think, to make sure that we're not just relying on EHR reports of what is happening, but we're actually looking closely at the fidelity of these practices. We found that there was um, before the Joint Commission mandate, we found there was non-completion of the secondary screener because it was optional. When it became required, again, it was completed more often. Um, we found that some of the people who screened positive for suicide were not receiving um, enough intervention. So, um, for example, uh, a minority of patients ended up receiving the safety planning intervention. Um, and we can see here how the safety planning intervention delivery changed over time. So before we um, started the study, there was really no safety planning being done in the system and each one of these lines represents a different emergency department and they went live at two month intervals and you can see that the safety planning rates increased um, as time progressed so the blue line is the smallest emergency department so it was very um, unstable <laughs> um, but certainly increasing over time um, and the um, we really found that even though safety planning was beginning to happen it still wasn't being done for the majority of um, patients who screen positive. We have been able to look at uh, clinical outcomes in the patients within our healthcare system um, and look at the rate of change of suicide risk screening and detection over time in the system of safety encounters. So these are patients with an ED visit at any one of the four study hospitals. And we found that the um, rates of screening increase significantly over time and the rates of detection increase significantly over time as well. So these are preliminary findings um, that we're still teasing apart, but it's interesting to see that the system of safety study of implementing the zero suicide model did seem to result in an increase in suicide risk detection. And it also was associated with a decrease in the suicide composite rate. So this was a combination of suicidal behavior and suicide deaths. Um, and they seem to have decreased over time at our study hospital. So very encouraging, still preliminary results, um, but it certainly underlines the value of the zero suicide model in um, healthcare systems. So we had a number of challenges associated with this implementation. So certainly sustainability can be an issue. It remains to be seen once the implementation support is withdrawn, how sustainability will um, sustainability in, in screening and intervention will continue. And it's very difficult to directly monitor fidelity. So we had some ways of doing that, for example, interviewing patients around screening fidelity, but we didn't have a chance to um, observe, for example, safety planning fidelity and how those interventions were actually done in practice. We found that reimbursement is a huge challenge in acute care. We know that things like caring, con caring contacts and follow-ups after um, a suicide related hospitalization are hugely valuable and effective, but there really is no reimbursement um, mechanism for that at the moment. So that is a big challenge. And really a lot of the suicide related interventions require attitudinal change and in-depth training, not just protocol dri driven changes. And it's difficult to take clinicians like off the floor to deliver that kind of really impactful training. So that was definitely a challenge that we faced during this implementation um, in a real world setting. Um, another challenge was reached, reach. So just because an intervention is offered or available, doesn't mean that everyone who should get the intervention will get it. And um, so we definitely um, are looking kind of more critically about, about what reach the interventions have within our system. Um, a few take home points is that it's important to really carefully plan both the selection of the right practices for your healthcare setting and also the optimal implementation strategies, maybe piggybacking off of what implementation strategies and infrastructure is already available within the healthcare system. And recognizing, I suppose, that fidelity and reach will probably never be perfect in a real world setting, but not to get discouraged by that. So, you know, if we think about if we're able to um, to apply the zero suicide model to large healthcare systems, even if the reach is not 100 percent and the fidelity is not 100 percent, there is still a significant proportion of people within that system who may get 
um, better suicide related care than they were receiving before. And that that can really add up to large public health effects when we look at, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of presentations to uh, a healthcare system, you know, over years. So it's important to be encouraged, I think, as well as being um, pragmatic and realistic when we think of these real world implementations. Um, so, yeah, I think I've only really scratched the surface of, of what our study um, was working on. So I hope that if anyone has any questions or comments or would like to connect at all about any of this work, please feel free to email me at this email shown. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, everyone. Good day. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Verna Little. I'm currently the co-founder of Concert Health and also the co-founder and chief operating officer for Zero Overdose. And I'm really excited to share with you some of the work that we've done around Concert Health, uh, around suicide safer care at Concert Health and some of the outcomes that we've experienced. So first, I want to just talk to you a little bit about what we do at Concert Health and particularly the model of care that we use uh, to have shown some of the outcomes that we've gotten around zero suicide and some of our zero suicide work. So we use collaborative care. Collaborative care is an evidence-based model of care that actually came out of the late 90s, early 2000s. It was originally called IMPACT. Um, it has since morphed into collaborative care. The original work for IMPACT was uh, for the first time that a mental health diagnosis was identified and treated in healthcare settings. And that really focused on seniors and it focused on depression. It was a large randomized controlled trial with about 1,800 patients, 400 primary care providers, and it really showed that when you put a system in place to care for patients with depression, then you got good outcomes. And since then, we have added anxiety, changed the name to collaborative care, and it has really spread to, in fact, now well over 100 randomized controlled trials that show that collaborative care is helpful for caring for individuals with depression and anxiety. So one of the things that we've noticed as we've done this work, that many individuals in these categories and particularly in primary care were identifying thoughts of suicide or being at risk for suicide. And so we really started to think about collaborative care as a way to care for those individuals at risk for suicide. And what's been really helpful is that collaborative care as a model has been recognized as a Medicare benefit in 2017 with some dedicated CPT codes. It is now actually in about half the states on the Medicaid fee schedule and also recognized by all of the commercial plans across the country and then, of course, Medicare Advantage. So that has really expanded the ability for organizations to adopt collaborative care. So talking a little bit about what collaborative care is, collaborative care is an evidence-based model to identify and treat patients with depression and anxiety in healthcare settings by adding two individuals to the healthcare team. The first is a collaborative care clinician. This person works really closely with the healthcare provider um, works really closely with the patient. And one of the nice things about collaborative care, it is not reimbursed by the session. It is a monthly case rate. And this is incredibly important when you're caring for people at risk for suicide because it allows the flexibility for that collaborative care clinician to talk to that patient maybe every day or every other day. And so having that monthly case rate really allows this collaborative care clinician the ability to focus in and be very patient-centered, really have uh, the time and the ability to follow up and coordinate with that healthcare provider. And the way that all of this is organized is with a registry. A registry is actually required in collaborative care so that nobody falls off the radar. The second person added to that collaborative care team is the psychiatric consultant. The psychiatric consultant in collaborative care meets with that collaborative care clinician every single week and talks about people that aren't getting better, are getting worse, um, and most importantly, who are at risk for suicide. And so then the opportunity to discuss that patient happens weekly um, or can even happen sooner so that the healthcare provider, the collaborative care clinician and the psychiatric consultant are actually available to be able to talk about patients who are at risk 
and then make recommendations. And so it really increases the access that people have to a psychiatric consultant. So one of the things that we know about this collaborative care team is that it is incredibly patient-centered and that the collaborative care clinician has the opportunity to use evidence-based practices that we know are helpful for individuals at risk for suicide. So all of the things we know work like DBT, like behavioral activation, cognitive behavioral therapy actually are all used during this monthly case rate to care for people at risk for suicide alongside their trusted healthcare provider. The psychiatric consultant can really make recommendations about labs or medications and really be there to consult with both the collaborative care clinician and that healthcare uh, primary care provider. And so it really increases access in a very patient-centered way to individuals who are at risk for suicide. And the core principles of collaborative care really are helpful for individuals at risk for suicide. And I actually firmly believe that it's a higher level of care than they might get in other settings because it is so patient-centered, because it does really focus on a population of patients. It already has a registry. And so the ability to track individuals at risk for suicide is much easier with a collaborative care caseload. It is very treat to target so that we're really paying attention to someone who's not getting better, where we're not seeing reduced risk and we're doing something about it. We're talking about that patient every week or every other week. So we're figuring out what to be able to do with all of the evidence-based practices that we know work, really holding ourselves accountable um, for that patient's reduction in risk. And it's very short-term, very high-touch uh, care. And so really incredibly helpful. And again, gives people the opportunity. And in collaborative care, there's multiple treatment choices. And so talk treatment, um, the sort of more traditional counseling or therapy, goal setting, medication adherence, and monitoring symptoms are all incredibly helpful um, for individuals. And what's nice is they're not wedded to any one of these treatment options. It can change from week to week. And so it really gives patients and their team the ability to be flexible and do what they need at any particular time. And so individuals who are appropriate for collaborative care, anybody under the umbrella of depression or anxiety really does well in collaborative care. Um, some alcohol or substance use patients with a history of trauma, and certainly many people who are at risk for suicide have many of these diagnoses comorbid to their suicide risk. So one of the things we know about collaborative care is that it works for special populations, so pediatrics and also women's health, and we know the increasing numbers of individuals at risk in both of those populations. So it's important in collaborative care to really educate your primary care and your healthcare providers to understand that if they identify or screen for individuals at risk for suicide, that there's now a system in place to be able to care for those individuals. It's important to think about the entire population of patients with behavioral health needs and that we're often missing many individuals now in primary care, given what we know that many people who die by suicide saw their healthcare provider in the month of death, and given the number of individuals that we're currently identifying and risk in primary care, there's lots of work to do. So it's important to talk to medical leadership and to healthcare providers to really engage them and let them know that if we put a system in place, that they could really um, continue to advocate for increased screening and asking people directly about suicide. We know that putting collaborative care in place gets people better. Um, there's actually data that shows that people not only get better, but that it can save some healthcare dollars. And I also think that as we continue to expand collaborative care for people at risk for suicide, we're gonna see numbers decrease in terms of emergency room utilization um, since providers will have systems in place and feel comfortable keeping people who may have some risk for suicide in their healthcare practice. 
I mentioned that collaborative care is a monthly case rate. This is a brief summary of what that looks like. And certainly there's information available on the Medicare website um, or also on the University of Washington AIM Center um, for detailed information. And there's lots of help out there to support the implementation of collaborative care. There are lots of things that are included in the monthly case rate. Um, you can see all of the things that are here. Essentially, all of that patient contact, so all of the phone calls, which can happen every day or every other day, can get counted in that monthly case rate. And so a lot of the work now that happens for individuals at risk for suicide, some of the follow-up and the telephonic work could actually be included in the case rate, which is some work now that actually is not reimbursed by a lot of healthcare organization. And so this really allows for increased access to evidence-based care, increased quality care for individuals at risk for suicide, um, increased access to psychiatric consultation. And so collaborative care can actually be a wonderful match for individuals at risk for suicide. One of the often common misconceptions about collaborative care is that it's actually a lower or lesser level of care. Um, but what we've seen is that people who are at risk for suicide do really well in collaborative care. We actually see reduced risk because it is so patient-centered and it does allow for very frequent high-touch um, and individual brief treatments like DBT that are incredibly helpful for those individuals at risk. We do recommend, and what we do at CONCERT is we stratify our patients at risk for suicide, really based off of the Columbia scale with patients who are historical. So we want to know about them because they're at risk sort of ongoing versus individuals that are low risk or patients who answered yes to the yellow questions on the Columbia scale. Um, our at-risk answer yes to the orange questions on the Columbia scale or high risk where they have some intent and answer yes to the red questions on the Columbia scale. And so we stratify risk using that information and we break it down so that currently in our population and generally now we run about 10% or a little bit greater of our patients are at risk for suicide. So as you can tell at this point, we have about 12, a little over 12% of our patients that are classified at high risk, meaning that they have voiced some intent. Um, we have about 26% that are historical, meaning maybe they had an event um, some years ago, so we know they're always gonna be at risk. We wanna know about it to do something different. And then a large percentage of our patients are sort of at risk where we're actively working with them around safety planning and treatment. Um, for suicide risk. So we've learned a couple of things. Um, we've actually learned that we can really impact the risk level for individuals in collaborative care. So about 30% uh, of our patients have had their risk flag reduced. Um, and so this is incredibly helpful taking someone from high risk to at risk as an example. We know that at discharge about a third of our patients now um, have had a risk reduction by the time that we transition them um, maybe off to other providers or that we're um, going to continue working with them. And about 23% were able to get to historical at discharge. So one of the things about Concert Health is that we partner with other healthcare systems. And so we have their behavioral health uh, or patients that were referred to us for behavioral health care. Um, so it's often um, difficult to wrangle all of those systems to really look at some outcomes data um, other than risk reduction. And so we've just started to look at this over the last couple of months. But what we're really seeing is that in collaborative care, we are absolutely able to reduce people's risk for suicide. Interestingly, we also learned something about staffing. And so I've done a lot of zero suicide work, um, have worked on zero suicide academies in the team. We thought we were doing a really good job of educating and training clinicians that were coming into our system. And I, I think that we, we certainly do um, a lot more than a lot of organizations. And what we learned, um, we saw that a lot of the individuals were actually at high risk. And we thought, why are so many of these individuals at high risk? And what we realized is that clinicians were still having difficulty understanding risk and putting uh, patients in the right risk category. And so what we found is that they actually needed some additional training 
and we put in place some subject matter expert specialized supervision. And what we found is that most of the individuals could be transitioned to at risk or historical, that they were actually not categorized correctly. And so what that allowed us to do was really use our resources to pay attention to the individuals that were high risk to make sure that we're following up with them, not letting it go more than seven days on that um, for patients who are at low risk or at risk that we're making sure they get the appropriate level of care or treatment. Once we put in uh, individual specialized supervision once or twice, we found that the clinicians were much better and much more comfortable really assessing risk. And so I think the take home message is that we just need to put that extra piece in. Um, so a little bit of learning for organizations doing this work that you might need to think about that and to really watch the percentage of patients that are stratified in the risk levels to make sure you might not need some additional training there. So at the end, um, we found that patients who are at risk for suicide can absolutely experience risk reduction during collaborative care, that it actually serves to be a higher level of care in many cases and give access to many individuals in many communities where there wouldn't be access otherwise. Um, so thank you so much for your time today.